Good afternoon, and thank you all for coming to this book launch. My name is Anne Marie Murphy. I'm a professor at Seton Hall School of Diplomacy and International Relations. Um, and on behalf of the New York Southeast Asian Network and the Center for Foreign Policy Studies at Seton Hall, it is my pleasure to welcome you to this book launch of I have the wrong side. Under Beijing's Shadow, Southeast Asia's China Challenge with its author, Murray Hebert. Um, Murray Hebert brings a breadth and depth of experience to the topic of China-Southeast Asian relations. Murray was a journalist for the Far Eastern Economic Review, a career that began in the mid-1980s in Fierce Bangkok Bureau, where he covered developments in Vietnam, Cambodia, and Laos, an experience from which Murray has published two books on Vietnam. He also worked for FEAR in Kuala Lumpur in the 1990s and later covered U.S.-Southeast Asia relations from Washington for the Far Eastern Economic Review and later the Wall Street Journal before transferring to the Wall Street Journal's Beijing Bureau. After leaving journalism, Mori was a senior director for Southeast Asia at the U.S. Chamber of Commerce, and they then joined one of Washington's leading think tanks, the Center for Strategic and International Studies, as senior advisor and deputy director for the Southeast Asia program. Today, Murray remains a senior associate at CSIS and the director of research at the consulting firm Bauer Asia. In short, Murray's experience as a journalist uh, throughout Southeast Asia, Washington and Beijing, as well as a strategic analyst covering both economic and security issues makes him uniquely qualified to write a book on Southeast Asia China relations. And as somebody who has read virtually all of its 560 pages, I can tell you that it is truly a tour de force. It is historically rich while covering contemporary issues in great detail, and it's very analytically sharp in addressing the challenges and opportunities that China's rise creates for Southeast Asia and the very different ways in which the Southeast Asian states are responding. So without further ado, I am going to turn the screen over to Murray, who will take about 25, 30 minutes or so to review some of the key uh, issues and themes that he covers in the book. And after that, we will open it up to Q&A. So for those of you who may have questions uh, as uh, the author is speaking, please uh, put those questions in the Q&A um, and please identify yourself. So without further ado, Murray Hebert. Great. Uh, thanks, Anne-Marie, uh, for, uh, for the kind introduction. And thanks to the New York Southeast Asia Network for, for the kind invitation to come here and talk about my book. Um, so you've already uh, sort of started uh, summarizing some of the key themes of the book. Uh, really, I, I go as as you alluded to, country by country to look at how they're all responding to China's rise. Uh, and it's really uh, fair to say that, that the countries, if you summarize, they, they really all view China as providing an opportunity, but also uh, creating a challenge. And the challenge is whether they're so basically whether their sovereignty will survive uh, the the uh, the sudden arrival, the gradual arrival, actually, of, of China and its move south, uh, and getting more engaged with the region. So I I go through in the book uh, des describing all the various kinds of tools that China has in the toolbox. It uses soft power, including economic cooperation, cultural engagement, educational exchanges, and increasingly also media engagement. Uh, they, China gets involved in, through hard power with military threats in the South China Sea and military sales to some countries, military exchanges. And the Vietnamese sometimes think China is also using sharp power when it puts pressure on them in the South China Sea to abandon some of its oil and gas projects. Uh, but I'll, I'm going to start with the economic cooperation, which absolutely everybody uh, basically approves of. Uh, it is uh, 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 trade has exploded for all the countries 
Uh, it, in last year, uh, in 2019, uh, China's trade with Southeast Asia was uh, 600 billion. Uh, that's double what the US trade was with the 10 countries. Uh, China is also a major player in infrastructure and uh, it has until till COVID uh, hit, hit the region. It was also a major exporter of, of tourists, which are uh, by far the largest grouping arriving in Southeast Asia these days. And in recent years, there's been somewhere in the order of 50, 60 million are arriving per year. Um, the Belt and Road uh, was announced with great fanfare, 2012, 2013. And, and uh, you would think, it, because they're offering uh, loans, uh, they're offering lots of um, you know, pretty um, stellar infrastructure that this would be, China would really be scoring here hand over fist. But really, it's been a massive struggle for, for China to get these projects off the ground. The high-speed rail uh, that it wanted to run from Kunming, China wanted to run from Kunming to, to Singapore. The first leg uh, uh, in, is going through Laos to the Thai border, but uh, it took five years to negotiate the Laos agreement. They negotiated over everything from land to to interest rates, but then the next leg in Thailand, it's 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 been under negotiation since 2014. They have had at least 30 rounds of negotiations, and the Thais are holding them off again for interest rates. For they would like to use uh, maybe some of their own engineers. Um, they would like maybe to get equipment from other countries. Um, and um, in Indonesia, they, they, they sort of snared a, a high-speed rail from the Japanese from Jakarta to Bandung. And, but that project was supposed to be done well before Jokowi, Jokowi faced re-election last year in 2019, but it is, it is really struggling also. And the problem is getting land. Farmers don't want to give up land uh, anywhere in Southeast Asia, maybe anywhere in the world, I don't know, but especially in Southeast Asia. Um, the, we don't know exactly how much China has invested uh, in the Belt and Road. Uh, a, a group, RWR Associates in, in Washington, has estimated that between, in the five years after 2013, China invested somewhere in the order of 200 billion in Southeast Asia. Having visited all the countries uh, during the latter years of, of that period, I'm, I'm dubious that it's actually that high. Uh, there are the Belt and Road projects, besides delays, face problems of corruption and kickbacks. Um, there was a lot of frustration in, in Malaysia in, in um, 2017, 2018 on the East Coast rail link that Najib had negotiated with, with, uh, with China, the former prime minister, Najib. Um, and, uh, his opposition, including uh, Prime Minister, former Prime Minister Mahathir, were really charging uh, that uh, accusing China and Najib of letting the project be over be over you know overpriced, so that he could take some skim money off the top for both repaying the uh, desperately uh, uh, um, over indebted uh, uh, one MDB, one Malaysia Development Berhad. Uh, and also skim off money for his own election campaign. Uh, and when Na Madhir then gets elected, uh, he cancels the, he postpones the project, but after 11 months of renegotiating, they finally got the project going. Um, and that's one thing you have to say about, about China. It, it, it is reasonably flexible and willing to compromise and it, it, it did that with the Lao on the railroad. It lowered the interest rates. It, it lowered the amount that Laos would have to pay and boosted the amount China would pay. And it did that by lowering, uh, re reducing the cost and shortening the distance of the East Coast Rail Link. Um, in many countries, China though does face a lot of criticisms of its project. We all know the famous Mison Dam project in Myanmar and Katian State in the, in the little finger that sticks up into China from northern Myanmar. Uh, that, um, that uh, you know, the Katian and others throughout the country protested uh, and uh, they 
they uh, they shut it down in 2012, and it, it China is still uh, lobbying on this, including uh, in a phone call between Xi Jinping and uh, and um, Aung San Suu Kyi within the last month. Uh, Jokowi in Indonesia in 2019 came under a lot of criticism from his his opponents, including. Uh, General Pabo is now the defense minister for depending too much on China for infrastructure. Uh, but the, the other new development that's just been coming, we're only learning about more recently, is that China has started to cut back on its lending. So it, it lent from the China Development Bank and Exum Bank as, as 75 billion in 2016 but that had fallen to 4 billion in 2019. Those are global figures, not for Southeast Asia. I haven't been able to get the Southeast Asia numbers yet, but, uh, and in face of the criticisms that China's facing, uh, it's, it's uh, people domestic, uh, that has domestic critics as well, uh, who think that some of the lending is going to rather shaky uh, projects and regimes that, that are way overextended. And this happened recently in Laos where China took over a Chinese company, China uh, Southern uh, Electric took over um, the uh, EDL, the uh, Lao distrib Electricity Distribution Company, uh, because it was so heavily indebted for, for taking credit for various things from the Chinese. Uh, there's also criticism, lack of transparency, lack of environmental and, and social safety and impact studies. So it's China is having to uh, adjust um, and it's doing it to some extent, which is uh, I think laudable. Uh, the one area where China is really smoking is in the digital Silk Road. It's really taken off and as investor in, in Indonesia and Singapore, uh, in particular, it's way out outstripping US uh, ICT companies. Um, it's investing in unicorns in Indonesia. We've all heard of companies like Gojek and Tokopedia, Traveloka, and uh, et cetera. Uh, Huawei is very active and only two countries have, have under US and other countries pressure uh, held Huawei at arm's length and that's Singapore and Vietnam. Vietnam said, hell no, we're not taking you at all. And Singapore let Huawei invest in some smaller uh, uh, accelerate projects while uh, Nokia and uh, Ericsson are taking the lion's share. It's also very involved in artificial intelligence, facial recognition. We're starting to see some of that now in the Singapore airport, for example. Um, uh, China fintech companies are also very active, especially in Indonesia. Um, so yeah, that's one area of the, the, uh, the um, the uh, uh, digital Silk Road, I think, is doing better than, let's say, the Belt and Road or a lot of the physical infrastructure for China. That is, um, I, I'm uh, I, I talk some about the ethnic Chinese. We all know the history. If you've spent time in Southeast Asia, you know there's ethnic Chinese in all the countries. They migrated over the last couple of hundred years. Uh, they got involved in helping the colonial powers quite in, in Malaysia, Indonesia. Um, but the, the thing that, and I think people generally in most countries accept the ethnic Chinese as the older ethnic Chinese is playing a sig significant role. The problem they face is with the newcomers who've come in the last two decades about. And so you find in Northern Myanmar, North of Mandalay, it's just increasing numbers of, of ethnic Chinese. Same is true in Northern Laos where they, they, they actually starting plantations, growing rubber trees, uh, watermelon, pumpkins, uh, all kinds of agricultural products that they use uh, chemical fertilizer and pesticides that uh, local farmers complain are hurting the uh, hurting the water supply and killing uh, draft animals, et cetera. Um, there's also uh, increasing numbers of ethnic Chinese showing up in Vientiane. They run a big market uh, in not very far from the uh, Watai International Airport. They're showing up in places in Bangkok, Manila. Uh, they're, 
playing a big role in the online gaming. Uh, they did. They also play a big role in, in gaming in Cambodia, especially in, in Sihanoukville. Uh, but China put pressure on Cambodia to shut down, down some of the online gaming. Both countries, both Cambodia and uh, China had declared online gaming to be illegal, but it, it continued uh, until China and Hun Sen, the prime minister of Cambodia, shut it down at December, late December last year. Some of that then moved across the border, across Thailand, across the border into Myanmar and is now operating in Cayenne Karen State in, in Myanmar. Um, I won't go too much into history because I really tried to focus more on the contemporary, but, but uh, you know, we all know that we've all heard that uh, China, especially the countries on China's southern border, long paid tribute. Uh, Vietnam was a colony for a thousand years. But after the, uh, the Chinese communist victory in, um, in, in China, they began supporting uh, communist movements in basically all the countries, even small ones like Brunei and, um, and ones in Singapore. Um, the, um, and that created a lot of anxiety and anger and some in, in places like uh, Philippines and Malaysia, you had a, quite a full-blown insurgency going so that they got foreign troops in, involved in, in fighting back against China. Um, and, and then in Indonesia, China face, faces the double whammy of also being accused uh, allegedly for being involved in the 1965 coup that resulted in several hundred thousand people being killed. It's really hard to figure out what locals think. Uh, obviously, the typical journalist strategy of talking to taxi drivers does pay off a little bit, but it doesn't really reflect, um, reflect, reflect uh, uh, inf doesn't really give you a, a view of the whole picture. The ICES, the Institute for Southeast Asian Studies in, in Singapore, does polling every year. And the poll that came out in January this year of elites. So that's uh, officials, businessmen, uh, NGOs, journalists, academics, th those kind of opinion shapers. 79% uh, of the elites uh, in across Southeast Asia said uh, in, Jan in December last year that uh, China has the most economic influence in the region. Only 8% said that about the US. Econ uh, politically and in, in, in security, 52% said China had the most political and strategic influence. Only 27% said that about the US. But when they were asked um, if they had to choose between China and the US, 46% said they would choose China. 54% said they would choose the US, which is you know, surprisingly close, I think, for people in Washington to realize some of that, those numbers have changed in the last four years under the, uh, the outgoing uh, uh, administration here in Washington. Uh, China has also developed mil -to -mil -tie, military to military ties. Arms sales are growing to particularly some countries. Thailand, after the coup, bought uh, some tanks, 28 tanks. It also ordered three subs, although it has postponed two two of the, the last two because of the uh, large protests that have emerged uh, in recent months. Malaysia has ordered four coastal patrol vessels. Uh, certainly, um, uh, Cambodia also gets a, most of its hardware from, from uh, China. Switching to uh, soft power, um, the, China has really ramped up in recent years. Um, it, uh, it, it's uh, try one of the goals is, uh, and I don't talk much about this, but there will be a uh, book coming out around the middle of next year by Josh Kurlancic. There is this proliferation of books on China, Southeast Asia these days. And Josh Kurlancic of the Council on Foreign Relations is doing a book about China soft power uh, and, but particularly focusing on, on the media environment. So part of China's uh, campaign, soft power campaign is to try to shape the media environment. It targets digital print, television, et cetera by providing uh, access to Xinhua, the, the Newswire, and uh, CGTN, 
It uh, funds, for example, in, in Indonesia, it fund, uh, excuse me, in Cambodia, it funds a television station. Um, and their goal really is to influence what, what locals uh, in the, especially in the Mekong region, what they're reading and watching about China. Sometimes there's some pretty, uh, pretty serious disinformation about, about events such as COVID. But it's not clear yet how effective uh, this media is. When I would ask people, they would, they would say, we really don't even watch this stuff. But you know, if, if more and more media puts Xinhua uh, news into their newspapers because it's free, they do this even in Thailand. You see this in the Bangkok Post and The Nation and, and other and, and even Thai publications. So that, uh, um, you know, it, uh, it, it, could have, it could have longer term influence in, in shaping views. China is also very active in, in uh, providing scholarships. Uh, probably somewhere around 80 to 90,000 in recent years per year. Uh, e the largest number uh, are from Thailand, the second largest from Indonesia. Uh, even Vietnam has a pretty large number. They, China has also boosted its establishment of Confucian Institutes. So there are well over 30 of them now, uh, and about half are in Thailand, which wouldn't surprise anybody. Uh, there's about five in Malaysia. I think uh, Vietnam and the Philippines each only have one, which maybe isn't surprising uh, because of their challenges in the, in the South China Sea. But Ch China is also very active in inviting party officials, um, academics, journalists, religious leaders to visit China. It's especially invited uh, a large number of Muslims, including imams, uh, from uh, Indonesia and Malaysia uh, to visit Xinjiang. Many of them come back with glowing reports uh, that it's, the Uyghurs are being treated very well, that they're in like a, a work camp, uh, a summer camp kind of environment. They pray five times a day, they can eat halal, etc. cetera. Um, the other thing that is a little surprising is their, their arrangements with political parties. So the, the former leading political parties in Malaysia, like UMNO and the Malaysia Chinese Association, or PDIP, Jokowi's party in Indonesia, Democratic Party of former Prime Minister, President SBY, uh, they all go there. And I, I talk to some of these people and ask them, so like, what do you do there? You learn about Marxist-Leninism, which they don't find actually that funny, but um, they're not learning it. They're taught about how to recruit people, uh, uh, members, how to do books, you know, how to, uh, re how to uh, balance books, where to uh, fundraising opportunities, those kinds of things. Um, I, I, and I, I think China views this not so much as an influence their politics as uh, an attempt to, to, uh, to convince people to think of China in a more positive way. But there, is some, there are attempts at very more overt attempts at political influence. In Malaysia in 2018, the ambassador was quite active in campaigning for the UMNO and for the Malaysia Chinese Association. In the end, uh, they lost badly. Uh, the, in the Philippines, it's often said that Duterte got money from, from the Chinese through ethnic Chinese and Davao, where he was the mayor. That's never been proven, or at least a smoking gun isn't out there. And then in Singapore, um, uh, they, when they had a, a spat in mid-2016 to about mid-2017, uh, because of some things that uh, Prime Minister Lee said about the South China Sea, including the need to follow rule of law, which really uh, irritated the heck out of the Chinese. They put a lot of pressure on Singapore, but to try to spin Singapore back, they talked, they, they lobbied Chinese businessmen. Ch uh, Singapore is the uh, biggest uh, investor in, in uh, China. Uh, and they, uh, the Chinese uh, use their influence with the ethnic Chinese business people to warn them that if, if, if they wanted to stay big players, uh, that their government would have to change some of its thinking which about China, which did not go over very well. Uh, but generally speaking, I, um, so China is not as overt 
and is obvious and hasn't been caught out as often uh, being involved in politics in Southeast Asia as it is, for example, in Australia and New Zealand, where they've been involved in supporting political parties, where they've been involved in, in getting some ethnic Chinese, including some that have been uh, teachers and in, in, in intelligence and military uh, and educational institutions. Uh, to getting them elected to parliament and into committees. And that's caused uh, a backlash over the last couple of years. They're also quite active in, in Chinese are in fishing and hacking. Um, when Vietnam was heading up uh, APEC in 2017, both Xi Jinping and uh, Trump went to Da Nang for the, the event. And uh, the Chinese were very active that year in trying to figure out what the what the Vietnamese were proposing, and in um, in uh, uh, trying to figure out their negotiating strategy in the regional comprehensive economic partnership and APEC itself. Um, they they hacked the Singapore Health uh, um, website uh, two or three years ago, and uh, ultimately snared a whole bunch of people's. Uh, uh, pharma, uh, 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 drug prescriptions, <laughs> um, thinking that would help them to understand uh, what uh, what what health issues people were facing, and then also uh, uh, in Indonesia, the the uh, during the last election, uh, Indonesian electoral officials said that Chinese and Russians hackers tried to uh, impact the uh, or tried attack the voter lists and tried to disrupt the elections that way. I'll end with just commenting very briefly on the Mekong River and on the South China Sea, which are the two areas uh, of probably the greatest dispute and frustration in some ways. So China, uh, the, the, the Mekong, I'll start with the Mekong River. Uh, it would have been good if I actually had put up a map, but, uh, but there is on the Northern, uh, uh, frontiers of the Mekong uh, in China, there are 11 dams. Uh, and then China has also helped build dams in, in Laos uh, along the mainstream and also in Cambodia, as well as on some of the tributaries, but those aren't qu quite as, don't have as much impact. Um, in lower, in the lower Mekong, in, in Laos, Cambodia, Thailand, and Vietnam, some 60 million people make their living off off along the Mekong f farming, rice farming, and uh, and fishing. But um, as China has has uh, increased its uh, it, it's uh, the number of dams that are open. Number seven and number eleven were open recently, and they have stored vast amounts of of water. And uh, this. This has resulted, uh, and this coming in the year of, of considerable drought, uh, the rainfall has dropped in, in the, in, along the Mekong, and it is creating a severe uh, havoc to the agriculture and fishing in, along the Mekong. Um, in Cambodia, you probably know that there's a lake called Tonle Sap, roughly in the middle of the country, that. Uh, that uh, uh, during rainy season, uh, fish move in with the water as it goes into the Tonle Sap, which expands. And then as, a, as dry season returns, the lake will, will shrink and the fish will move out. And in that whole process of the fish moving in and out, there's a lot of spawning of fish and that keeps the uh, river uh, full of, of seafood. And then uh, in Vietnam, you have the, the uh, the uh, Mekong Delta, which is really a major breadbasket of Southeast Asia, um, that it, um, it is below sea level. And so it needs silt from Tibet that has been coming down forever. And it needs water to keep the South China Sea from in intruding. So now with China has, has denied uh, that it is involved uh, in affecting the water flow, but about six or earlier this year, um, in spring, uh, a group called Eyes on the Earth sent satellite photos over, over China and, and captured uh, photos and information about how much water China is holding behind these dams that are not making, the, that water is not making its way to the lower Mekong. 
and the Southeast Asians will, are going to have to figure out what they're going to do about it. A couple of these countries, Cambodia, Laos, and to some extent Thailand, are quite friendly with China. Uh, Vietnam has a much more cantankerous relationship. But um, this China provides a lot of aid to these countries, but the aid in the end is not going to nearly pay for the loss of livelihoods for farmers and fishers if if this, if this uh, blocking of water continues. Then in the, the South China Sea, which is the sea that, uh, that surrounds uh, Vietnam, um, Malaysia, uh, uh, Indonesia, the, the Philippines and, and Taiwan, that, that whole area is, is the South China Sea, as you know, and it has a nine dash line in it that uh, that the Chinese have, have, in which the Chinese claim about 80% of the, of the um, water in the South China Sea. And uh, so beginning in the mid, mid 70s, China started to snare some features from its neighbors, starting with Vietnam, and then moving from taking the Paracels and Johnson South in 1974, 1988, and then Mischief Reef at, from the Philippines in 1995 and Scarborough Shoal in 2012. Um, and then uh, when the Philippines took China to the arbitral tribunal to, uh, to challenge China's takeover of Scarborough Shoal, uh, China began very quickly building artificial islands. So it has now built seven islands by pumping sand and coral out of the bottom of the sea. And four of these are now equipped with uh, these islands are now equipped with airfields that have military, that are capable of, of landing military aircraft. They have radar, they have missiles. Um, and one, so one of China's top goals is to gain control and sovereignty over the sea. But more recently, uh, it has also made clear that it is, is trying to put pressure on these countries over their oil and gas exploration and exploitation uh, and 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 their the operation of their fishers in the in the within the uh, areas claimed by China. So late, I, I don't know. Uh, you could go back further, but I'm going to just say in the middle of last year, uh, Chinese Coast Guard vessels and maritime militia vessels really harassed the Dickens out of out of uh, a, a, a Vietnamese oil and gas exploration activity off Scarborough Shoal, which is off the Mekong Delta, and then off Luconia South, which is off Borneo and in, in, um, uh, uh, just uh, off of, uh, off of, yeah, just uh, off Sabah and Sarawak, uh, where, where Petronas has been pumping oil and gas for, for decades. Um, they harassed them for months on end and then earlier this year also uh, came back and started first by harassing uh, fishers in the uh, in North Natuna in Indonesia in the waters off the north uh, northwest of it, Indonesia but uh, Indonesia is not a claimant and yet uh, but the nine dash line is we don't know exactly how wide those dots are so um, uh, they're uh, uh, so they, the Chinese will claim, even though they, they recognize they don't have a dispute with Indonesia, they say that, that North Natuna is a historic fishing ground for China, and therefore they have a right to send their fishers in there if, if they want. Uh, Indonesia and Vietnam have pushed back quite heavily. Malaysia has been rather a tepid in its response, uh, partially um, uh, because Malaysia fears that uh, some of its uh, its economic uh, relations with China could be impacted if it pushed back too heavily. Although Vietnam can prove the contrary, Vietnam is by far the biggest trading partner with with China, and despite the fact that it pushes back, it uh, it still remains the biggest uh, biggest trading partner of, within Southeast Asia of of China. And and Marie, with that, I think I'm going to stop. Okay, Murray, thank you so much. That was an incredible uh, presentation that covered so, so much. Um, 
And you ended on the challenges, right? I mean, you opened up your presentation saying that the biggest challenge China posed to Southeast Asia was over sovereignty. And you ended on the Mekon where it might not exactly be sovereignty, but water is life, right? And um, China withholding of that water uh, certainly gives them a stranglehold over the downstream countries. And I guess you pose the question that the Southeast Asian states are gonna to have to figure out what to do. Um, and I guess I'd like to ask you a little bit about what you think uh, they might do. Um, for those of you who have not read Murray's book, he ends it with a series of questions about what Southeast Asia might look like um, in 2030 or so. Um, and clearly one of the questions is this one of water. Um, you know, in the past, we've seen the Southeast Asian downstream countries create the Mekong River Commission and try to uh, do some work through that. The US has supported that, but China has essentially usurped that, right? By creating the Lanchang Mekong Committee, that is clearly a China dominated top down institution. So given that what we've seen in ASEAN and given the inability thus far of collective action by Southeast Asian countries vis-a-vis -vis China, do you think that the water issue on the Mekong is of sufficient severity that it might push countries to some type of collective action? Or is China going to be fairly successful at buying off Cambodia, Laos, et cetera, et cetera. I mean, how might you see that playing out? Yeah, that's a, that's a great, good question. And it's really hard to quite, it's, it's hard to find a crystal ball that tells you exactly what's gonna <laughs> happen. Um, interestingly, Vietnam was the head of ASEAN uh, this year, the chair, and they tried to raise the Mekong and Laos and Cambodia were still pretty reticent. The Thais are starting to get more active. Right. And I, I think once Thailand and Vietnam would would um, rally on this topic, it might bring Laos and, and uh, Cambodia together. Um, you know, it's, it, it is going to really take uh, all these countries uh, uh, working together to put pressure on China. You can get China, as I, I pointed out, you can get China sometimes to change some of its behavior domestically, but when it's dealing with bilaterally with one country, it hasn't really been very responsive to, to a grouping like, like, like ASEAN. Mm -hmm. But I think if the countries that are being under pressure from uh, China in the South China Sea and the ones on, on the mainland, you would then start having what six or seven countries that would have views on this, uh, on the China's use of and claims to water. You could, you might be able to change China's views over the long haul. Um, uh, you know, it won't be easy. Uh, so far, China has only offered to share data about water, but I think. Uh, as uh, the international community also gets more active, the U.S. and Japan and Australia are getting much more active in the Mekong. They may be able to provide these countries with some under, uh, you know, background on what could be done. There is this thing called, um, well, I don't know if I'm going to get it quite right, but it's the Convention on Non-Navigable use of water in rivers, something like yes, that, that yes, was yes. established <laughs> some, some years ago. And in Southeast Asia, only Vietnam signed on to that, but there are something like 16, 18 rivers that start in China and flow into other parts of Asia. And if, if, um, if, if uh, the Southeast Asians would start cooperating, I think with, with um, uh, South Asia, Central Asia, you might be able to convince China that it's in their own interests to find ways to share this water. China's view now is if it starts in China, it's our water. We want to use it fine. That's ours. Um, that's sort of not the international view of, of water. So maybe they, but, but it's not going to be easy. It won't be easy. Right. 
Um, I'd like to remind our uh, viewers that the Q&A uh, question and answer uh, box is open. Um, there are no questions in the box. We would love to hear from you. Um, so please uh, post your questions and uh, we will get to them. Um, in the meantime, I'm gonna keep asking my own questions to Murray, but I'm sure that he would love to hear yours as well. Um, so just following up on, you raised the issue, Murray, that the United States, Australia, and others are becoming more involved in the Mekong. Uh, many would say that, you know, it's kind of too little too late. Um, but in a webinar recently, um, another colleague from a DC-based think tank, uh, whose name I won't repeat just because I might uh, misquote uh, their, their saying, <laughs> made the comment that it's critically important when the U.S. takes a stand on things or outside powers, because China tends to have a dismissive attitude towards many of the Southeast Asian countries um, and that it does expect their deference and it doesn't uh, calculate its national interests as being sufficiently expansive to uh, account for some of the benefit towards those countries. And I'm curious in your research if that was the view that you found, um, that China did have a somewhat dismissive attitude uh, towards many of these Southeast Asian countries, and that having that outside pressure was critically important. Yeah. Um, yeah, you can find lots of examples of China's dismissiveness of, of the region. Uh, looking down their nose at them, and you can find comments by academics that describe various ethnic groups as being lazy and stuff. Um, but uh, uh, the Southeast Asians, if you ask them, what does it take to stand up? One of the things they will tell you is it's terribly useful for the US to be here as a, as a balance. And the one area where they really they they felt they felt they have felt both you know beginning with Obama or even before but with Obama through Trump's administration that the military was present the Seventh Fleet was sailing th past these islands with their so-called freedom of navigation exercises quite regularly and that was fine but what they uh, what the thing that they would regularly complain about is that the US just wasn't economically as engaged as it needed to be. So yes, American investors, companies uh, from financial services to ICT to oil and gas, they're all there, but, but you know, they come on their own. With China, when you invest, you bring the government. With the US, you, when the private sector invests, it's just the private sector. But what they would like the US to do is be involved, I mean, one of the things I always cited is why did the US leave the Trans-Pacific Partnership? It just left us hanging high and dry. Um, mm -hmm. They signed the Regional Comprehensive Economic Partnership with, with China, um, which is not a very high standard trade agreement. So it just basically harmonizes other uh, agreements that have been signed earlier, but still it is, it is significant. But they really want the Biden guys, Biden administration, to find ways to engage. And we've all heard Biden say that he doesn't, he doesn't see that he can get engaged in, in uh, tr regional trade agreements until he deals with some of the challenges at home, meaning right. COVID and the economic crisis, et cetera. But they, the Southeast Asians think that, that if the US would be there, uh, investing side by side, working on also challenging some of the rules of trade that, that China tries to practice, that it would be influential in holding China back and giving them a little bit of space, more space to breathe, for sure. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, I did some research on that and I, uh, the passage of the TPP was the only time the Malaysian parliament ever voted on a free trade agreement precisely because it was so controversial and so many of the 
um, standards that the U.S. demanded were, were so high. Um, no country would have benefited as much from the U.S. Um, I think that's uh, a huge lost opportunity, as you indicate, uh, both for the U.S. as well as for many of the economic reformers who really stuck their neck out there. Okay, we have two questions now, I'm delighted to say. Uh, one is from Wayne Forrest, who you probably know is the uh, president of the U.S.-Indonesia Chamber of Commerce. Um, and his question is, isn't most of China's efforts uh, in Southeast Asia related to self-interested economic issues rather than political ones, since China's economy is now blended with capitalism, is its behavior in Southeast Asia so different from other outsiders before them, such as Europe, the US, and Japan? Yeah, good question. Um, certainly, uh, China's goal, what, the economic role was very important to China. It, it still is looking for, as Wayne knows better than maybe many of us on the call, that, that China imports a ton of coal, lots of coal, lots of uh, minerals from, from Indonesia uh, to, for its uh, economic, drive its economic machine. And so it's importing a, a ton from the region and it's also exporting a lot. It's exporting, it's importing um, a lot of components for the uh, su supply chain, uh, which irritated many people in the early days of the Trump administration. And it really had a lot of the equipment we needed to protect ourselves from COVID and even some of the components for the medicines we needed. Um, the, I guess, <clears throat> You know, yeah, there are people debate exactly what China all intends with its economic influence. Some of it is just to have an outlet and an, you know, and and, and a source for for raw materials and, and other things. But there's a, a feeling that some of China's uh, uh, development has has more political and uh, and security implications. For example, it's been trying for years to build a Chukchu. Uh, uh, port in, uh, in, on the Indian Ocean in, in Myanmar off uh, uh, Rakhine State, uh, that ill-fated state. Um, uh, there's really nothing there uh, for you need a port for. Um, China does actually have oil and gas to an oil pipeline and a gas pipeline that runs from 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 Rakhine to to Kunming. Um, but it really, there isn't much industry around there that would warrant having a, a, a giant port like they want to build. So people assume it has something to do with dual purpose. And, you know, Ch China has also been involved increasingly in Cambodia and in the helping them develop the Reem port on the Gulf of, of Thailand, uh, which is a facility that the U.S. helped build some parts of, not the whole thing, and uh, but two buildings that the U.S. had built in recent years were blown up in the recent months, in the last two months, and uh, new facilities are being built. And it's also assumed that 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 is going to be more of a a military port. It is it is a navy port now, and so China might might use it on a rotating basis. Uh, like U.S. uses Darwin or some of those facilities, or s even Singapore. Uh, <clears throat> um, is China any different? I mean, in many ways, China is is doing what other other big powers did as they rose. Right? They invested more. They they uh, traded more. They tried to have various influences on on governments on on the uh, social scene. And, you know, I, I'm not saying that China is totally different. At the people in the region want China there. They just don't want only China there and they don't want a heavy footprint. Uh, and so they would, they really, with the US sort of missing a little bit the last year, they've looked increasingly to Japan, uh, Australia, South Korea, the EU, and they're hoping that uh, the Biden administration gets more active too, to sort of challenge some of China's moves. 
Okay, thank you. Um, so we are going to uh, shift to, I'm sorry, there was a question here regarding China's soft power in Malaysia from Ismail Malik who asks, what are the most significant ways China uses its Confucian Institute scholarships and connections to the Malaysian Chinese Association to influence local public opinion? And how effective have they been? Well, it, it does, it, uh, yeah, it, it does uh, use soft power very similarly to, uh, to what it's doing in other countries. So yes, it gives visas to students and, and scholarships. It does build the Confucian Institutes to study uh, a Mandarin. Uh, what I basically heard in Malaysia when I was doing research is that many, many of the students are actually Malay or, or non-Chinese that are mm -hmm. studying Mandarin because they want to be able to get jobs or travel to China or, or whatever. And um, in terms of soft power, uh, the the uh, there is some influence on the the um, uh, boy. I'm blanking on the name of the major Chinese newspaper. Um, I'm blanking right now. Uh, that which was set up by uh, by uh, or it was purchased and then boosted uh, by a, uh, a Sarawakian uh, Chinese timberman timber operator. Uh, he uh, came, he he bought the company when it was under financial distress, and he built it up, and then expanded it across the region, uh, and including setting up operations in San Francisco and and uh, Vancouver. And the goal and uh, the goal really is just to to have a Chinese voice in the in the um, in the media. Uh, it it uh, to tell the tell the stories from the perspective of China. So what happened under COVID or what is China's view of this? South China Sea gets a lot of stories. What's China's view of this whole thing? So how successful Ch China is, is really a huge question. And nobody, nobody has figured out yet from China's use of the media and, and the soft power, how efficacious it is. It's just impossible. No, nobody's been able to do the polling or the, you know, the analysis to see whether views in a country changed over a period of time about China and its activities in the region. So I'm afraid I, you know, I, I know China is very active. It, it provides money to centers in at the University of Malaya, for example, to, to study China. Uh, and so it obviously comes with a certain perspective. Uh, yeah. But it, it's not really very different in Malaysia than in a lot of countries. Not, not nearly as active as Thailand. Thailand Chinese are really active. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> it, it was interesting for what it's worth. I did a lot of interviewing on that topic in um, Thailand about a year ago. And um, one of the top scholar, Thai scholars of China um, at Tamasa said that um, the undergrad students who went and had good experiences were very kind of pro-China. But when they sent grad students, particularly in liberal arts or anything beyond STEM, they tended to have a very negative experience because they were used to a much more open academic environment. And they actually came back with negative feelings about China so that it was very differential based, at least from the students, um, what they were studying and what their background was prior to going. So um, that, that's something I'd want to study more. Okay, so we have um, two questions related to kind of China's FDI and loans. Um, and one is from Chimdi Chukwe, a uh, student of mine at Seton Hall, who asks, um, what are the lessons from Southeast Asia's experience dealing with China's foreign direct investment and loans for countries outside of the region, particularly Africa? Well, I, first I have to confess, I'm not an expert on Africa, so, uh, <laughs> but, 
a couple of th lessons that I think Southeast Asians are learning, and I think they probably are, would apply in Africa, is that they really should coordinate more. They should talk to each other more uh, about the investment that, that uh, China is planning to do. For example, on the railroad, they, the Lao and the Thais got China down to about 2 or 2.3% 2 interest. Malaysia paid 4.5%. Uh, like why, if they had just talked, they could have found what you could, you know, you could get. And one thing you got to learn is, know is that the banks, the China Development Bank and the Exim Bank, which are the, the, the uh, banks that do most of the lending, are for-profit banks. So they've got to make a profit. And so they want to charge as much as they can get away with. Um, the, the, uh, so I guess the two things I would, I would the, the, one of the biggest things I would recommend is before anybody takes uh, a credit from China or let, allows China to build an infrastructure project, go talk to people who've experienced this and compare notes because you may find you can get it cheaper, you may find you can get it better, uh, you may find that you have to contribute less and they'll contribute more because a lot of these projects benefit China at, maybe more than they do the the recipient country um and that that's i think the the uh the those are the two biggest things that i think uh i i, I watched as as the as the uh Ch china started building infrastructure in southeast asia the other is you can negotiate on how many ethnic chinese you allow in uh laos just sort of opened the door uh, ties have been very strict and it hasn't worked. Indonesia has tried to be strict, but then sometimes it doesn't quite work. And then we've seen the protests that happened in the, in the mines in Sulawesi this summer, right? Right, right, right. Um, Yeah. Okay, thank you. Murray, can I just follow up um, on your last comment about the, in, the incentives of the big Chinese banks for profit? Obviously that, conflicts, right, with the government's political goal of portraying BRI as China's gift to the world or whatever Xi Jinping um, has called it. How Do you have any sense for how the government in Beijing tries to reconcile that? Because clearly we saw at the second BRI summit, you know, Xi Jinping recognized some of the negative impacts of BRI and pledge to, you know, grapple with some of these issues, whether it be environmental issues or um, overcharging by banks. I mean, do you see any attempt to redirect in China? Well, one thing that we haven't talked about at all yet is that there, what, what is China? When China <laughs> goes to Southeast Asia, what is it that's going? There isn't one unit united f juggernaut coming down the, you know, down the rail or the highway. Um, there are so many forces. You've got the central government with its views. You've got business and, and uh, state-owned enterprises with another view. You've got the provinces. Uh, uh, Guangxi and and uh, Yunnan with another view, um, so everybody's trying to get their piece of the the action, and um, so it is hard to I think she you know have can have his edicts, but it's not necessarily going to translate quite like that on the ground. That's one problem. The other is that the Belt and Road not only is getting criticized abroad but also at home. Uh, where people are saying, what the heck, you know, we still got poor people. It's a little bit like, you know, the U.S., the same criticisms the U.S. gets on, on foreign aid. What the heck, you're spending all this money in um, these countries when we could use the, the poor people need help, our healthcare system needs help. Uh, we have a lot of challenges at home. The environment needs cleaning up. Uh, <clears throat> so, uh, it, it is a debate uh, in China, and I think that's probably why, and it's really cranked up over the last, before COVID, um, and probably around 2018. And I, I think part of it is, is the criticism at home, uh, spending so much money, but it is, yes, it is presented as a, an aid project effectively, but 
you know, I think countries quickly realize that China is trying to get rid of some of its savings to, to invest some of its savings. So you want to give loans. It's trying to get rid of surplus labor. It's trying to get rid of surplus steel. It's trying to get rid of surplus cement. You name it. And so it, it's uh, uh, it's got a lot of goals of the uh, Belt and Road. Okay. Well, you ended on Belt and Road, and the next question uh, was actually on the Belt and Road. Um, and it's from Ahmad Chowdhury, a grad student at Seton Hall, who asks if you could elaborate on China's willingness to negotiate and compromise with nations in Southeast Asia uh, over BRI. Um, under what conditions? And is that done to make BRI more attractive and China viewed as politically more benevolent, uh, that might not be the right word, uh, or is it simply an economic issue to try to keep the deal? Um, yeah, uh, that's a good question. I, you know, you never quite know motives, right? But. Um, I'm going to, I'll describe to you very briefly what happened in Laos, because it is really pretty amazing. Tiny Laos with 7 million people, a GDP of back when they were negotiating the, the, the railroad five years ago, maybe a GDP of about 14, 13, 14 billion, which the railroad was half the cost of the GDP. Mm -hmm. um, so they, China came in wanting a 4% interest. China wanted uh, Laos to pay for about 80 or 90 percent of the project. It, China wanted 100 meters on both sides of the railroad. You want that because your your people can then populate that and they make make a living uh, living along the railroad, like we see in Asian railroads, right? Um, uh, those are some of the big things. Well, Laos said, well, that's not all going to work. We're not, we're not going to spend half our GDP on this railroad. So the Chinese agreed that they would set up a, uh, a company that uh, China and Laos would jointly own uh, and that Laos would only kick in about 700 million, six, 700 million dollars, which is about a tenth of the cost. And the most of that cost would go to resettling people who are being displaced by the railroad for the, from the land. Um, they agreed to shrink it down from 100 meters to about 15 meters on each side. And they, uh, except around stations, they still have a little more. I can't remember off the top of my head what that is. Um, yeah, and so, but but Laos is kind of worried with that railroad was going to be, it was supposed to be done next year, but because of COVID, the rail workers pulled out or stopped working, and so it won't be done till 2022. But with the other reason why you want to talk to your neighbors, actually, for the earlier question about the lessons for Africa, is know what the heck your neighbors are going to do, because Laos assumed that Thailand was going to keep building the railroad. Now, lo and behold, you got the railroad running from Kunming to Vientiane. Boy, that is not the hottest economic route on the planet. I mean, you're gonna, you're gonna have tourists traveling that once or twice, and you don't need a high-speed rail for mangoes and sticky rice, you know, you just don't. <laughs> and so it would have been good if the Lao and the Thai, Lao had asked the Thais, are you gonna do this or not? Mm -hmm. um, but I think, yeah, they realized, the Chinese must have realized that this thing wasn't going to go anywhere, the Lao Railroad, if they didn't soften the terms. But it hasn't been proven to be much of a sweetener anywhere else yet. Um, you know, the Thais haven't given in. Uh, and the Thais are really quite worried, I think, about sovereignty issues. They just don't want to give China that much say. They want to involve their own people, et cetera, uh, their own engineers. Yeah. Yeah. I know it's, um, as you mentioned, 30, uh, 30 different meetings thus far negotiating. And as a, a colleague of mine who works on Thailand says, you know, the military was in power there. Mm. If they really wanted to, they could have 
push that through without a lot of civil society support. And they didn't, even though that regime, Prayut, is just so dependent on the Chinese. Um, yep. So uh, I think, and, and this is one of the things I love about your book, Murray, is that it really um, focuses in on the agency of the Southeast Asian states, really trying to push back, fight for their rights. Um, in a way that I don't think always gets covered, mm. particularly in Washington, where mm. so many tend to view the Southeast Asian states as only uh, only through the prism of U.S.-China relations and don't look at the very complex way in which the engagement works. Um, yeah. So I'm going to, I guess, ask you, a little bit more about that agency. I will also tell our audience that I have read all of the questions in the queue. Um, so any of you who would still like to ask questions, please do so. Um, and I guess I, I'd like to ask you a little bit about um, your views on Indonesia. Um, because as you noted in your opening remarks, um, Indonesia has a very complex uh, history with China, right? Um, lots of, well, I shouldn't say lots, right? Three to 5% of the population is ethnically Chinese, economically privileged, and this real historical sense of viewing China as a threat um, as a result of 1965. And that's easily mobilized, as you, you note. And yet, I also feel very often in my discussions with certain Indonesian officials that they've always felt that China would not do unto Indonesia what China had done to the Philippines or Vietnam. Um, that the Philippines was always viewed kind of as an outsider in, in ASEAN you know, and Vietnam, lots of historical issues there, but that Indonesia, because of its size, because of its purported leadership in ASEAN, that China was gonna treat it differently. Um, and even though we have seen those incursions that are much more frequent um, and many unpublicized into the Natunas, we still hear a lot of that, I would argue, a bit of complacency. And you certainly don't see Indonesia investing in maritime defense the way that one would if you were an archipelago fearful of a growing maritime threat from China. So I'm curious on your research where you see the Indonesian view on China and the maritime domain? And if you see perceptions changing? Well, uh, I think one thing that did change is that uh, Jokowi has gone at least twice now when China has been incurring, incur, incursioning or whatever you call that, <laughs> uh, to go, gone there himself. But um, and he, the, the, the Jokowi government is moving more, more naval facilities to Natuna I think that does suggest, and the, and of course, if you ask an anal, you ask uh, the Indonesian military, they say no, no, that's just to protect the. It's nothing to do with China, <laughs> but uh, uh, protect the fishermen. Yeah, yeah, protect the fishermen. Um, yeah, uh, and but it's it is interesting where uh, Jokowi, the, the current president, where he does the projects. So he has kept China out of. Jakarta, basically, out of Java. He's got them in Sulawesi, North Kalimantan, North Sumatra. There's four places. I forget. Which one did I forget? Uh, so they're all in really remote areas where they're building dams or, or doing mining or that kind of thing. They're not involved in setting up factories and uh, power plants like they in main population areas, major population areas, like they are in Vietnam, for example. So 
it's clear that 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 Jokowi understands that China being too close to the power, I guess, could perhaps have some impact. And so he's found a quite clever way to to keep them, hold them at arm's length and yet let them be engaged because he is letting them invest sizable amounts of money, but but far away from capital, from 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 big population centers. Um, yeah, are they, I, it's interesting. I, you know, Jokowi also is a little different president than at least his predecessor, right? Who was very foreign policy focused. Jokowi is very domestic and really wants to build infrastructure. And he doesn't see where else this, they can get it from. Get it, right. And um, so, yeah, even, even for the big fund that, uh, that uh, coordinating minister LaHood is trying to set up, he's, Courting, well, he's courting both the Americans and the Chinese to kick in money. We'll see what happens with the Americans because he Lehut got to Washington a little late in the day when he arrives in the middle of a disputed election. That was maybe not quite the right time to land here. But um, yeah, I, I, you know, they're not going to get very close to the U.S. either, right? So there's all these reports that that. Uh, that uh, Pompeo asked them to let P8s land in uh, fly out of Indonesia, and you know, which P8s are mainly used for for spying on China and the South China Sea. And he said no. Um, I mean, that's being in very Indonesian, right? Sort of tr having such a, they're almost religiously equidistant, or holding everybody at an equidistant uh, at equal distance because they are such a I mean, they are so big in, in, in Southeast Asia, being almost half the population, half the economy, uh, mm -hmm. that I think they think they can manage. But, but boy, I, I don't know that they know the half of what China's doing. Um, if, if they're doing all this stuff off the Philippines and Malaysia, they've got to be doing a lot more uh, further south from Natuna. Right. Yeah. Yeah, and I think, well, as you keep repeating, Murray, the Southeast Asian countries need to chat with one another more often um, <laughs> and, and learn some of those, those lessons. Yeah. Um, I'm gonna, we're at 1.14. So uh, unless another uh, question shows up, I think this will be uh, the last one, Murray. Um, and that is that, on this issue of Southeast Asian states uh, having greater agency and voice if they could come together collectively. It's also very true that Southeast Asian states have so many overlapping conflicts themselves mm. uh, in the South China Sea, um, you know, historically going back to the 60s with Sabah and um, the Philippines and Malaysia claiming that um, we've seen a little bit of, you know, joint submissions to the UN law of the sea by certain countries recently, you know, again, trying to ensure that it's not just one country, but another um, pushing back against some of the assertiveness on China. But we don't see that much. Do you, do you see any of that changing um, in the years that you were kind of writing this book because things have changed so much um, over the last five or six years. Uh, do you yeah. see any greater, any greater willingness on the part of the Southeast Asian states hmm. to resolve some of their differences? <clears throat> Not really. Um, so they really haven't started seriously negotiating. They have occasionally over the years, but recently they haven't done too much. Um, yeah, the, the Vietnamese and the Filipinos, the Malaysians and the Filipinos have, have, uh, have, have overlapping claims. And I think it would be a good example to China if they would show how you can somehow find an equitable way to divide this territory that could be rich rich in hydrocarbons. Um, yeah, even when, when Malaysia and Vietnam were being harassed almost simultaneously for months on end in 2019 and 20, 
2020, this year, uh, they did terribly little comparing of notes. Um, uh, it seems like the, the, I think the Vietnamese are, they say they're quite interested. Malaysia says, well, you know, we, we don't think China will go very far on this. Well, it's, you know, it could soon be too late. Um, uh, the Philippines and Vietnam, Philippines was much more cooperative with Vietnam and Malaysia before Duterte took office. Right. And that, that's something we haven't talked about at all, but, but Duterte is really interesting. He, um, so he, he gets the arbitral tribunal ruling two weeks that worked in his favor, in, in the Philippines' favor, like 90, over 90%. And, and he goes to China. He, he says, well, I'm going to be yours forever, and I'm going to divorce the Americans. And he leaves signing $24 billion of, of uh, projects. None of them have come to flourishing. So it's bizarre to me that China would get a guy, maybe he just gave everything away. Maybe he sold the candy store before it was even on the market. And so, so he gave everything away, but they, they've gotten a few hundred dollars of irrigation canals and a few hundred million of irrigation canals and bridges. That's it. What, I don't, I, I might have said this in the book too, I don't remember exactly, but I was so stunned that China and Manila wouldn't move heaven and earth to show that going, cooperating with China has huge benefits. They've gotten far less than anybody else. And I don't know if the Philippines is just a difficult place to do business, which lots of people say it is, um, uh, or what. But, but uh, you know, I, I would... Uh, more recently, the military um, under which Duterte let the military keep its cooperation roughly going with the U.S. and right. hasn't really forced them to move closer to the Chinese. It could be that the next, when the next president is elected in 2022, that uh, the new administration will be more open to cooperating again with its neighbors. Um, we'll have to see. But it is, it is really uh, stunning how, how they all want, everybody wants to go to China on their own. They feel that if they cooperate too much, they'll get dinged for their sins of their neighbors or something. And I think, I think you'd be better off just coming with a joint voice. Yeah. Well, I would certainly agree with you, but you and I are not directing Southeast Asian policy. Maybe that's good too. <laughs> <laughs> I think so. I think so. All right. Well, ladies and gentlemen, I think we're going to end it there. I very much want to thank um, our author, uh, Murray Hebert. The book, again, is Under Beijing's Shadow, uh, Southeast Asia's China Challenge. It is really a fascinating read. I, I highly recommend it to anybody. Um, I very much want to thank Murray. I also want to thank Srinith Kool of the New York Southeast Asian Network, who is the one working behind the scenes to uh, make all of this happen. Thank you, Srinith. And on behalf of Nisian and um, the Center for Foreign Policy Studies, a uh, big round of uh, virtual applause to Murray. Thank you very much.